where they're from using that chat function. So uh, I know we attract an audience from all over the country and it's just really satisfying to see. So if you can find that chat window, um, drop us a little note about, about where you're uh, joining us from. So um, yeah, thanks, thanks again, Luke. And uh, if you haven't participated in one of these engagement sessions before, I think you're in for a treat and you'll wanna keep your eyes open for future, uh, future engagements. Um, so we're hosting an excellent speaker today. Um, Tim Tamir is with Tucson Water. And um, I have, can, can testify to being in several um, meetings and strategy sessions and dedicated uh, information sessions and have heard Tim speak. And um, it, uh, he really brings the idea of um, water resources to life in a way that I've, I've never seen before from uh, utilities managers. Um, so I'm excited for this morning. Um, if we think back very, very briefly here to September 2019, um, one of our employees, actually development director Keith Ashley was downtown on the Santa Cruz River and noticed, uh, he and his partner noticed there was a very unusual bird stalking around in the recently wetted Santa Cruz Riverbed. And this turned out to be quite a big deal. This was a purple gallinule that was enjoying um, waters coming from the Santa Cruz River Heritage Project. I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about this morning. Um, the Heritage Project uh, literally turned on the, the faucet in June 2019. So you could see it just took a couple of months, um, not only for all of our you know, regular resident birds, but also some, some newcomers to show up and start taking advantage of that situation. For those that don't know, um, for those probably who uh, don't know because you don't live in Tucson, uh, Tucson Water is a big operation, over 500 employees, and really responsible for providing the potable uh, water that we enjoy here in Tucson in our homes, and um, also working really hard on water reclamation. Um, as you can imagine, uh, living here in the desert, uh, every drop counts. And um, we're fortunate to have Tim and his team in the lead um, over at Tucson Water. Um, about 715,000 customers. So we're grateful, Tim. Um, please pass that along. Um, Tim's leadership is a big part of why Tucson is recognized as having an industry leading water conservation ethic. Um, so that's by necessity, but we're also uh, pretty progressive here as a community. We have a state of the art um, facility that um, is, is helping us have a resilient water supply and um, being able to provide water reliably to community members in our region. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to taper off the introduction here, but uh, just so you know who you're hearing from this morning, Tim has 22 years of experience working in public utilities, private industry and consulting. Um, you're going to hear he's a great speaker, but also he's been involved with strategic planning um, in all aspects of sort of water, municipal water supply. He has a bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois, a uh, master's of engineering from the University of Arizona, and a graduate certificate in water policy also from the University of Arizona here in Tucson. So without uh, further ado, uh, let's offer a, a virtual welcome to this morning's speaker, uh, Tim Tamir. All right, thank you very much. And hopefully I didn't just hang up on you, no. Uh, let me know if you can hear me okay. Just You're good, Tim, up. thanks. Okay, thanks. all right, thank you everybody. And thank you for that introduction. I will do my best to live up to it. And this is Jack, Jack the cat who is now my work buddy and joins me for many of these engagements. So um, thank you all for being here and for welcoming me. Also, um, it was really cool seeing all the locations that people are tuning in from. And uh, shout out to those in Milwaukee. Uh, my brother lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, so uh, this is the time of year where I call him every weekend and ask him how the weather is, at least for the next four months. So Anyway, uh, it's good to be here. Thank you all. And I am going to dive in. So we're talking about 
water in downtown Tucson, and we're talking about um, how uh, how we got there, how Tucson Water and the city and all of our partners along the way uh, got to the point where we were able to reestablish perennial flow um, in the Santa Cruz River Channel itself, and um, in a way that uh, hadn't been present for over 70 years and what some of those outcomes are from the utilities perspective, but also then we'll transition into um, the folks from the Audubon Society talking about um, the birds and the wildlife that have been um, attracted to that location since we, since we turned on the tap as was just stated. So a little bit of the background, if you, um, if you, uh, don't know the Tucson water story, uh, I'll do it in one or two slides, which is uh, a difficult task, but we'll, we'll do our best because there is a lot to tell. But as it, as it pertains to the Santa Cruz River Heritage Project, it really begins with um, our uh, almost sole reliance on groundwater for decades. So why, why does the reliance on the aquifer, reliance on groundwater, relate to the river. The, the issue is that the Santa Cruz River used to flow perennially through downtown Tucson and in many other stretches um, historically and, and for millennia. And it was when um, modern settlement began to occur that not only was that river itself diverted and used for um, agricultural purposes and for municipal purposes, uh, but eventually we invented the pump and we invented the ability to pump groundwater from beneath the land surface to satisfy those needs. It wasn't very long after we began pumping groundwater that we actually disconnected the river itself from its groundwater and its groundwater sources. So we actually dried up the river. And by, by the 1940s, 1950s, it was, it was essentially dry. Uh, for, for most parts of the year, um, it would only flow in the form of, of major rainstorms. And we actually had um, not only dried up the river, but we began to dry up the aquifers. We had our historical over-reliance on the aquifer was not sustainable. Uh, we had water level declines in the aquifer, the groundwater water table beneath Tucson and beneath the Santa Cruz River that began to uh, become on the order of several feet per year. And in fact, in urban Tucson, in, in kind of central Tucson, we, by 2000, we had drawn down the water table by over uh, 300 feet in parts of the aquifer. We knew that was not sustainable. We also began to measure land surface subsidence. So we were not only seeing the water table beneath the land surface go down, but the actual settling of the ground surface and downward movement of the ground surface in the form of land subsidence. In Tucson, it hadn't yet reached the uh, magnitude of several feet like you've seen in parts of California or even in parts of, of Pinal County, Arizona, uh, but it was enough to cause a significant concern because in an urban area, land subsidence is, it can create all kinds of infrastructure challenges. And by the 1990s, we also, uh, under the 1980 Groundwater Management Act in Arizona as followed up in the 1994 with the Assured Water Supply Program, it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for Tucson to demonstrate that it had an assured water supply or a 100-year water supply based solely on groundwater. And the map on the right is from the U.S. Geological Survey. It, it's a little bit dated now, but it shows a large red zone uh, generally in the Tucson and Phoenix areas, among others, showing that the groundwater overdrafts were in the high category. Again, all of these data points pointing to uh, a challenge of sustainability. We did a number of things as a community to address that. And I can't take credit for this. All I can do is say, I'm just the, the latest in a long line of people who've tried to bring Tucson to a, a, a point of water resource sustainability. So we, we, we refer to these actions as one water actions, which in, 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 a, in its simplistic form means treating all water as if it has value. In the past, we used to only focus on groundwater and things like stormwater or our locally generated wastewater were viewed as, as things that needed to be 
managed or disposed of. They were never viewed as resources. Really changed in the 1980s, maybe even as early as the 1970s in Tucson. And it's really shaped how we uh, deliver water to this community currently and into the future. So under that one water approach to, to, to water supply, we began with two things that were, were coincident. One was diversifying our water supply. We, and by the 1980s, we actually created a reclaimed water distribution system where we recycled municipal effluent and we use it still to this day for non-potable uses like large turf irrigation um, and uh, playgrounds, street medians, golf courses, um, our local parks to offset that over-reliance on groundwater. In the 1990s, we also, for the first time, introduced Colorado River water to Tucson. If you know the Tucson story, you know that that was what we call the debacle. By, uh, from 1992 to 1994, we were successful in reducing our reliance on groundwater, but we were very unsuccessful in doing it well. And we had what we called red water problems. We had damage to infrastructure. There's actually a book that just came out within the past year talking about those issues and how Tucson water turned it around. But we had the right idea. We just had the wrong implementation. By 2001, we had changed our tactics and we had actually gone to what we call recharge and recovery instead of using a conventional treatment plant. And that is what um, got us to um, a diverse water supply where now we're predominantly reliant on Colorado River water. Couple that with our conservation and efficiency and our reduction in uh, water use, uh, more efficient water use. And in fact, right now we use about the same potable water as we used in the mid eighties. We also started storing water for the future. So our available Colorado River water was able to be um, not only used for current use, but we store it in our aquifer for the future. We expanded our partnerships, including not just locally, but we have partnerships with the city of Phoenix, with Las Vegas and others uh, for how we store and manage water together. And then we also have shifted our viewpoint to be uh, viewing multiple benefits. It's no longer just enough to deliver safe and reliable and high quality water. That is our core mission but that's not enough. We are looking at how we support our overall community. So in about 2016, uh, we began to rethink what our recycled water future looked like. Uh, leading up to that point, we had a ever increasing total demand for water. Um, by the mid 2000s, actually we were uh, our total demand was roughly equivalent to our total amount of Colorado River water rights we had. So we were looking at what is our next supply and that next supply even on the potable system. And so we were looking at uh, purified recycled water as a potential solution to that, um, to that need, to that gap. But we were able to pause in 2016 and look at how things had changed over that 10 year period since 2004 and how our opportunities had shifted. So we saw that our conservation ethic was strong and it was having the effect of actually decreasing our total water demand even while our community was growing. We looked at how we had reached, we had reduced our potable water use to mid 1980s levels by about 2016. We looked at that our use of reclaimed water or that non-potable use of, of wastewater effluent had leveled off. We had actually picked all of the low-hanging fruit and we are, uh, had converted virtually all of the large turf onto the reclaimed system. So there was no longer uh, predictable growth in that, in that use of water. And our drivers had opportunities and shifted. And that's when you really need to recognize that moment and take the time to rethink things. So we did. The uh, picture you see now is, is really reflective of kind of a, a, it's a picture from the past. It's the Santa Cruz River around the turn of the last century. And it is, it, so about a hundred year old photograph. And it is, it's showing a flowing vibrant river 
with a flowing vibrant ecosystem associated with it. This is kind of a view uh, looking uh, with uh, looking north in the Santa Cruz River with uh, Sentinel Peak to the to the left. That um, became an iconic image just for us to think about. Can we think beyond the aquifer? And I just need to pause for a moment and say, between 2001 and 2016, we had, by the successful introduction of Colorado River water, really saw our aquifers beginning to significantly recover. So in the areas of Aver Valley, west of, Tucson, of the Tucson Mountains, where we do our recharge and recovery of Colorado River water, we saw significant water level recovery or, or increases, even though that's still where we're producing water from, we were net importing more water than we're using. And in central Tucson, where our groundwater, our historical groundwater over pumping had occurred, we had um, reduced that pumping and eliminated in some cases so that natural recharge had begun to recover the aquifer there. And we have invested so much in that, but we had become really solely focused on the aquifer. And it was an opportunity for us to pause and say, we've had a lot of success there. We're on the right path with the aquifer. What's next? What should we be looking at next? Well, we began to look at the Santa Cruz River as our next opportunity, not just um, to really try to recover something from the past, but also as a modern way to look at water management. But we had one major obstacle there. Well, there, there were many obstacles, but one major one is that the water management institutional framework in Arizona incentivized, uh, if you owned municipal effluent or reclaimed water, it incentivized you to take it out of a river system, to take it out of the channel and put it into a constructed recharge facility. And so this, this picture on the lower right is sort of a depiction we began, we created in order to to illustrate how this institutional framework uh, creates some unintended consequences. So in the lower right, um, you see uh, a depiction of a flowing river. That's what uh, the past was like, and that's what we would argue the future should be like. And on the right, you see a constructed recharge basin. What you see is that whether water is discharged into that uh, dry wash or dry river, or into a constructed basin, percolates downward and reaches our regional aquifer in much the same manner. However, the institutional framework in Arizona said, if you do the actions on the right, you get essentially 100% credit for the water that recharges the aquifer. That means you're made whole on that supply. If you do the action on the left, which is discharge it to a river like the Santa Cruz River, you only received 50 credit for that water. So there was always this built-in incentive over many years for water owners, water managers like Tucson Water to say, if I want full benefit of my water, I need to take it out of the river channel. And we did, we built the Sweetwater Recharge Facilities, which has some wonderful aspects to it in the form of the wetlands itself. But um, the recharge basins themselves are disconnected from nature. They're just locations where we discharge water to get it into the aquifer. Whereas right over the berm in the river channel is where river could be charged, we were not given full credit. For that. We had the willingness to challenge that. We also had the shift in mindset to embrace our potential to support quality of life in Tucson. We needed to think more broadly than just supplying safe, reliable water. And we had success on all those fronts. So what one of the things that was born out of one water thinking and that reset of how we view our role in society was the development of the Santa Cruz River Heritage Project. So this was an up, we had some infrastructure from the reclaimed water system that um, crisscrossed the Santa Cruz River in a couple locations. So if this is a buried pipeline or multiple buried pipelines that are maybe 20 or 30 feet below the, the river bottom. And, but they're an opportunity because we had a pipe there, we had the ability to deliver reclaimed water to that location. And if we could think about different ways to use it, it unlocked thinking that led to what if we had, what if we used the Santa Cruz River 
between about 29th Street and Mission Lane or further downstream as our recharge facility. We have uh, clean water that was uh, underutilized. We have a reclaimed water system that no longer had growth in it, so we had capacity. And then we had a willingness to challenge the institutional framework to say, let's use the river for our water management. But it's not limited to that. It is a multi-benefit project. And before I make the next click, I'll just say this is a picture from the dedication of the, the Santa Cruz River Heritage Project. This was June 24th, 2019. This is about five in the afternoon. We actually did the dedication in the afternoon for a number of reasons. Uh, but this was the number of people that came out on a 105 degree day at four in the after, 430 in the afternoon to, to celebrate this project. And you can see as soon as we opened the flow, how immediately it impacted these, the, these citizens of Tucson. And it's been evolving ever since. But it's more than just water management. We took into consideration the value of flowing water in this river as its own value. Even though we don't have a paying customer for that, what we have is a benefit flowing to the community. And how can we support that flowing water? That flowing water will generate riparian habitat and native vegetation along its flowing reach, which has significant cultural, historical, um, environmental, and economic benefits associated with it. And I just see in the chat, this is actually in the River Channel, um, just, uh, just north of 29th Street. So this is between 29th Street and 22nd Street. And the little pavilion up on the bank, which was, is not there now, it's just a tent, is, is along Santa Cruz Lane and about 26th Street. There's actually a, a, a location, which we're gonna be doing some improvements to in forms of a connections trail. So people could actually come to that overlook and then if you hiked a little bit south along the bank, along the loop trail, you can get to where there's a little maintenance ramp that goes down. So you could visit it from above or down in the river channel. So that's between 29th and 22nd, looking north. So we know we would attract that native vegetation. We also needed to be mindful of flood protection. So the Pima County Flood Control District was a key partner on this because we're actually operating in the river channel. We're changing the characteristics of the river channel bottom. And they were great in modeling outcomes, but also working with us to do this correctly. And then the economic stimulus, not just um, of the um, ecotourism and other benefits associated with a riparian habitat in an urban setting, but also the whole development of the downtown corridor has actually been influenced by the fact that we now have a flowing stretch of the river. But it, it goes well beyond those, those tangible and measurable benefits. So I, I, I always reflect on this um, posting that was on Facebook from Javier Morales, a, a Tucsonan. Um, this is June 25th, 2019, the day after we opened the tap. And, and Javier wrote, he's emotional watching this. Water in Santa Cruz, part of my dad's childhood in the late 30s and early 1940s. He told us stories of playing the river as a boy. He requested we spread his ashes along the Santa Cruz leading to San Javier. With river now flowing, thinking he's at peace up there. This is not the kind of reaction a water director or a water utility gets from their projects in the old manner of thinking. But when you broaden your horizons and you think about how we can contribute to quality of life while doing really nice water management. These are the types of outcomes that you can, you can get. And I need to click. And it's continuing to this day. So we've had the, the flows for just over a year now, and especially in the, in the pandemic and the time of COVID, having people being able to to use the loop trail, interact with the, the, flowing, of the uh, flowing stretch of the river has been, has been a continuing benefit. It's been a continuing um, uh, emotional connection from the, from the community. We thought at some point in the distant future that this stretch of the river might be an opportunity um, to support endangered species like the Gila top middle. Within just over a year, 
we have already achieved that goal, which um, was just a vision. It was a dream. And now it's, now it's, it's been made reality. On Monday, October 26th, actually, we had concluded a safe harbor agreement with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Arizona Game and Fish. And they were so confident in the project and the right, and, and already this wetland riparian area that already has been established uh, near the outfall that they brought um, over 500 Gila top minnow and did a, a, a release into the heritage stretch of the river on October 26th. And so this was a partnership with many and it really shows um, how, how much can occur in a short time frame when you, when you actually do the right things. And so, th and that's our mayor, Regina Romero on the left and then actually in the bottom inset, uh, she was part of the team to be able to release these top minnow, which were um, harvested from the, um, the Nogawa stretch, flowing stretch of the river. Um, and the quote from our mayor, my heart is so happy after releasing an injured Gila top minnow into the Santa Cruz River. It's really um, goes back to that connection, that heart and that how these impacts can be um, even uh, whether they're measurable or not really doesn't matter. You can feel it when it's right. And you can also understand the impact that you can have um, as a water utility when you, when you think a little bit more broadly. So we're, we're really excited about the fact that those Gila top minnow were released. Um, I will also mention that uh, Michael Thomas Bogan from the University of Arizona has become like the number one champion of the Cruz River Heritage Project by doing detailed studies of it, but also um, really taking beautiful photographs and really at, uh, on social media advertising the, the positive impacts it's had on multiple species. Um, dragonflies is one of the ones that he's very well documented how quickly they return and how the species abundance has been. Um, and also really helping us do this well um, because we're not biologists by any stretch, but what we are is, is those who want to work well with others, have great partnerships and doing things, doing things that really benefit the community. So with that, um, I, that's really the background on the, on the project. That's really where we are with, um, it today we're flowing at about 800 gallons per minute. The flow uh, actually currently goes all the way um, underneath the St. Mary's Bridge routinely, often um, under the Speedway Bridge. So it's actually flowing over a much longer stretch of the river than we had initially envisioned. Uh, we are getting our recharge credits through the state, through this activity, um, but really it's the, these moments, these, these, um, connecting the urban setting to, to nature. That's been the, the biggest benefit that we've seen and it's all happened within a very um, short time period. Uh, with that, I know that there would be discussion about what types of bird and bird species have already been found in this stretch of the river. So I'm uh, going to um, stop sharing and allow the conversation to continue. But I am here if you have any specific. Thanks, Tim. Really appreciate it. That was that was awesome to hear, and very informative. And uh, o Olia Phillips, our citizen science coordinator, is going to share some thoughts about what we've been doing with bird surveys along the river. Yes, thank you so much, Tim. It's so interesting to learn about everything that went into planning and making this project ongoing, um, as well as um all the projects and um organizations that are partnering um with you on this so um we at uh, tucson audubon society um, like many other people were so excited to hear the news about the water release in the urban stretch of the santa cruz river uh, we were not only excited for the fun of birding that it might bring, but also for the birds themselves. Um, for those of you who have birded in an arid environment, you know that even a small uh, puddle of water will gather a lot of birds. And so water really brings um, not only a lifeline for drinking, but also a lot, um, the habitat and vegetation that it brings. Um, it was also really encouraging to learn that 
in 2016, more than 70,000 bird observations and a total of 221 species were recorded um, in the northern stretch of the river that already contained reclaimed water since 2013. Um, discharging some of the city's recycled water upstream increases um, the chances of bringing um, the bird diversity to the historic downtown stretch of the river. And we had this rare opportunity to start from the project beginning and follow along and document everything that it um, brings to the area. And so who's better to do it than our very talented Audubon volunteers. Um, this project also attracted the attention of many academics. Um, Tim mentioned uh, Michael Bogan, the assistant professor of U of A's natural resource and the environment department. Uh, he's quoted here in the recent world water issue um, saying we expected that species would return to the river downtown but not quite as rapidly as they have. Within four months of flow being released into the river, over 30% of the dragonfly and damselfly species known from the entire state of Arizona had colonized the new stretch of river. We also found uh, several species of native toads and native garter snake within a couple months. It's been exciting to see all the birds returning to the river to such as herons, egrets, and kingfishers. The Heritage Project is really providing a wildlife oasis for downtown Tucson. And I think that's really well said and encompasses um, all the different species that are um, actually being affected. And I'm not an expert in the insect life of Arizona, but I know that it's a huge component of um, different bird species diets. So I wanted to see um, if there's an increase from year to year um, along the stretch, um, I looked at iNaturalist observations for the area. So on the left, we have June 2018 through June 2019. Then we have June 2019 through June 2020. And um, as you can see here along A Mountain, um, the observations are fairly similar. This is only isolating um, insect observations, so we're not looking at any other type of organisms um, just here about same a little bit more, but right along the channel here, we're really starting to see a lot of observations being added. iNaturalist is so great. It's that um, it's an, it's a website and a mobile app that allows citizen scientists like us to report any organism observations. Um, and those observations can then be used by scientists and projects, um, but also, um, citizen scientists like us that are curious about a location. Um, so similar to eBird, um, the way it centers on birds, but this is for all, all organisms. Um, so these insects, they're the food that attracts uh, many insectivorous birds. And you can see that um, moisture is truly a factor um, that brings those insects in, but also the um, vegetation that the water supports. So what we did is we began by selecting nine points along the river. Um, the nine points were selected based on best access as well as being representative of the area. Um, so we have them starting at the outfall valve here at point one, then going north up to just past Grant to point nine, uh, which uh, overall it spans about four and a half miles. We then recruited a team of uh, volunteers that chose to do um, a couple or all of the points, whichever they preferred. Um, some observers overlapped in the sign points, um, but that uh, only made our data stronger. Uh, some did it on foot and some rode their bikes, some drove to their points. Every month they had to go out to designated points at least uh, in the last 10 days of each month. Um, they had to do it within the first four hours of sunrise, which is when the birds are most active. 
extra kudos to them for sticking with it in the hot summer months. It's been such a dry and hot one this year. So thank you so much for getting that data for us. Um, at least at each, each point, sorry, um, they were to stop and observe birds for five minutes, submitting a checklist by eBird or sending it to me. Um, any birds counted between the points were submitted as incidental. So this is very much like the protocol for Tucson bird count for those of you that are familiar with that. So by submitting everything into eBird, um, this data is available for others. We're not hoarding all this data. So um, anyone in the future can follow along this journey as well. So since this is our first year of collecting um, data at these points, uh, we didn't have our uh, points to our data to compare to. Um, so what we decided to do is to compare the, um, uh, them to eBird hotspots that were representative of the same area. I have them outlined here in red. Um, here you see Yuan Park, Grant to Speedway, Speedway to Congress and Congress to Silver Lake hotspots. Then we did a little bit of analysis and um, don't try to, um, you know, try to read this fine print. I just wanted to show an example of um, the analysis process we did here. So we looked at the frequency of detection of each species. So how many um, checklists, what percentage of checklists contained that um, species that we're looking at? This is all the percentages that we're seeing here. And this is just a snapshot of our species of interest, the ones that are most often associated with a riparian habitat. Um, over the years, we, we can, we're starting to see a notable increase in um, a lot of these species. The last two columns here are, um, so the last column here, we have hotspot data from eBird uh, from the same amount of time that the water has been in the river channel. And then the last column here is directly from our point counts. So we were able to compare them to each other and also over the years previous. And so some people might say, well, why not just compare it always to eBird data? Uh, well, because eBird can be a bit uh, biased in the way that um, it gathers uh, data. So when there's like a rare species, it usually gathers a lot of uh, birders looking for it. So then the frequency of report for purple gallinule goes up. Um, point count data is unbiased in that way because all birds are counted at fixed points and fixed periods of time. So <clears throat> over the years, we'll be able to compare those um, to each other. But right away um, in this table, I just pointed out a couple that stand out to me. For example, kill deer went from 0.7% to over 76%. Green heron doubled in frequency to 23%. Uh, black phoebes also increased tremendously from single digit number to over 30%. And we're going to actually look at them further. This is, um, we further pulled out um, the ones that uh, saw the most um, increase, the most change over time. <clears throat> and, um, so you see an upward trend for all of these species. Some of, our, some of them are more drastic than the others. Um, we see some species are showing a slower but steady growth um, such as black phoebes and herons. This top one here um, mm -hmm. is an abrid's toey. So let's look at them closer. Um, for example, black neck stilt. Black neck stilts frequent um, shallow ponds with muddy bottoms and grassy edges. Um, they're usually in pairs or small groups. And we're seeing a small, but it's a noticeable increase in their sightings. And it's consistent over um, eBird data here, as well as our point count data. Killdeer. Well, killdeer, they don't have to have water near them, 
they um, are often found near water in Arizona because of nesting as well as um, favored for foraging opportunities in flooded fields. And we're seeing a huge increase here um, in hotspot immediately. So um, looking at 20, 2005 through two, 2018, um, it's a very small percentage. But then going into 2019 and our point crown data, they're found over 60 or 76% of the uh, checklists contain a uh, kill deer. Averitt's toeys, they're one of my favorite birds. Um, they, lo they love low elevation riparian corridors. Uh, we can see that they've now found on more than 90% of all checklists here. Black Phoebes, um, they're most commonly found along streams and ponds with marshy vegetation, overhanging trees. Um, they love the low open perches like in this picture. And we're seeing a, a, a sloped steady increase in their frequency, surely indicative of the increase, um, increased insect load of the river. Vermilion flycatchers. So while vermilion flycatchers are not strictly riparian obligates, they're most often found in areas with high insect count. Also, we often see them in the well-irrigated parks, etc. Um, their numbers have also gone up in the stretch of the river from 20% here in hotspot data on eBird going up in 2018. There's a bit of a dip here um, in the hotspot data from last year, but we are seeing that 100% of all of our point count checklists have a vermilion flycatcher detected. Song sparrow is another interesting one. They're, they're now becoming much more common along that stretch of the river. They're usually found near a water's edge and now 30% of all checklists in the point count data and in the hotspot data contain a song sparrow. So it's also imperative to, found, uh, to point out that not each species is found in just one point or that all points uh, have all these species. So in fact, uh, water doesn't reach all points. So you can see that evident in the song sparrow, you know, it's uh, found closely to the outfall valve. Then um, avid stoeys, they're found all over. Then killdeer are also found all over, even when there's no water. Um, it was also a special treat to see rare birds utilize the heritage uh, project waters just a couple months after the water release. Um, Jonathan Lutz mentioned it that um, one of our own, Keith Ashley actually discovered this bird. Uh, the range map here, <clears throat> shows that they are rare in this region. This picture was taken by Richard Frey near Congress in September 2019, so just a couple months after the water release. Um, and it's shown to utilize the waters and feeding on the meaty dragonflies, as you can see here. Um, and many of you have heard that we had a northern Chicana further north near Aina. So that's another stretch of the river receiving supplemental water. So this just shows that birds really hone in on good habitat, whether it's for a stopover on their migration route or their year-round residence. It's, it makes a huge difference in their lives. By the end of June 2020, um, our project wrapped up some really interesting uh, stats. We had uh, also, 12 ob observers going out to the point counts, contributing 139 of their volunteer hours for this project. 177 checklists were submitted and 71 overall bird species detected. So we're so excited to continue this project and build upon our data to compare to each other, to contribute to the scientific understanding of how it affects um, the bird species around here. So 
we're really excited to continue along. And if you would like to be part of this project, let me know. Uh, we're very flexible. So even if you're here for part of the year, you can still contribute. Um, you never know, you might be the person to see Northern Jacana in the heritage waters. Um, this is my terrible picture of uh, the Northern Jacana at Ina Bridge, but I'm very proud of it. And um, yeah, so I, I'll take questions now. Awesome, thank you, Olia. So at this time, we don't have any questions in the chat, but does anyone oh. have any um, questions that Olia or Tim would be able to, um, to answer for you? Oh, Tim, so Kathleen Fullen was wondering uh, if to hear more about um, the decrease in the flow that's been happening every once in a while. Sure. Um, with the within the first year of the project, we did um, a number of different experiments with flow rates in order to we, we it, it's it's a different kind of project in that we don't know what the outcome was going to be before we actually put water in the river. We didn't know how far the flow would extend downstream. Uh, we didn't know how broad it would be across the river channel. So we did. Um, increase or vary the flow uh, up to about 2,400 gallons per minute as, as kind of a maximum. Um, and so that was part of the flow changes that occurred. Um, another uh, constraint that we had in the first uh, 10 months that, or first year that uh, is no longer a constraint is that uh, the flood control district has been doing a series of maintenance activities or dredging activities in major washes. And they had not done that maintenance activity in this stretch of the Santa Cruz River in about 40 years. So we knew going in that we were gonna to have to accommodate that construction activity. And that's what happened this past summer. We're actually for a period of about a month, we went to zero flow for a period of time. And so if you've seen uh, the river channel compared to when it started to where it is the way it looks today, um, they actually did a, a major project to clean out the channel from sediment. Uh, they did preserve most of the large trees along most of that stretch of the river. Um, but then um, working with Michael Bogan and others, we actually delineated a wetland area right at the outfall that did not get disturbed during that maintenance activity. In older school thinking, it would have just been bladed out, but we wanted to preserve that that outfall wetlands that we created even in that short period of time. So that's explaining <coughs> most of the flow changes. Mm -hmm. What I will say is we also have a constraint in the fact that this water is recharging to the aquifer and per our permits with the state, we cannot let the water table rise too far. And there's one particular area, there's an old abandoned landfill not too far from the bank of the river in, in downtown. And we have to keep the water level in the aquifer below, well below that aquifer or below that, that landfill. So right now we're flowing at about 800 gallons per minute and the water table beneath that landfill is actually declining. So there's, a, there's an opportunity. We may vary the flow again. We may increase the flow, but we've sort of found this 800 to 1,000 gallons per minute as kind of a sweet spot. That does generate flow all the way to St. Mary's Road which is several bridges further than we originally thought. It does maintain a recharge to the aquifer, but it maintains water levels beneath that landfill. So it's, it's sort of a, um, the, the operational spot that works well for us right now. I'll just, one more comment on that. It's a natural river and when big natural scouring flow comes through, it'll probably read a sediment and a new river bottom when we when we're uh, when the flows uh, when the floods mm -hmm. uh, settle down so we'll have to adjust again at that point but the the key is to have uh continuous flow and have it establish a a resilient riparian zone that that can withstand floods uh over time yeah yeah that's really good to know uh, there's a couple other questions one um What's the impact of the drought on this project? You know, I, we all know we received very little rain this year. Um, has that impacted it at all? 
So the, the availability of this water is not impacted by drought. That's one of the reasons it, it is something that we can essentially uh, assure that there will be flow because it's derived from the wastewater effluent from our community. So uh, the, while drought does impact our water resources, it does not have a direct impact on our availability of effluent or reclaimed water. So that's a benefit. Uh, what the drought does do is because we didn't have a monsoon this year or a, we had a non-soon, we didn't have a big scouring flow come through. So we don't know um, what a scouring flow will, will mean moving forward. What we do observe though is over time, you need those scouring flows in order to maintain the recharge because over time, if you just have this discharge of flow flowing through the same stretch of river, it builds up a uh, algae and silt layer right uh, at the base of the flow, which then uh, what that'll do for us is it just means the flow will go further downstream. Um, but it, it just means recharge is less on, on that stretch and then the scour flow comes through and restores that. So those are the impacts of drought. Doesn't impact, impact water availability to this river, but it does impact the, the performance of the river. Yeah, uh, Seth was also wondering, you know, there's uh, the Santa Cruz River flows r south of us near Nogales, Tubac area, and now flowing here in Tucson. Is there any uh, thought or any prospects of restoring the Santa Cruz River in between those two sections? That's a big question. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> there... Um, so what, what, I, what I like to think about it is, is kind of in two ways. One is the fact that we have, even though they're disconnected, the fact that we have these continuously flowing stretches is a benefit because they, they can support a habitat and species in their, in their little niches. And then they all connect in these major flows. So we've seen the benefits of even that when you, um, even before we released the Gila Top Minnow to the stretch, you know, um, it was not released in the northern stretch, but it uh, came through natural flows. So um, those natural flows do connect the river, even if we don't connect it perennially. What I will say though, is we're not done yet. There's potential projects um, to move further south in Tucson with a perennial flow. That's uh, just a big old tease for you because I can't really uh, promise anything, nor can I commit to anything specific there. Right. But I can say we want more of a good thing, and there are opportunities to do things further south. Whether or not all, all that stretch between Nogales, Rio Rico, and uh, Tucson, I don't know of any active movement there. But I, I believe you all are are aware they didn't um, they didn't broadcast this widely, but there is a flowing stretch on the San Javier Reservation that was created through the Asikias project uh, with Colorado River water. So um, there, there, there are more stretches of the river are flowing today than 10 years ago. And I could see that increasing in the next 10 years. Wow, that would be awesome. Uh, there's a couple other questions on the landfill. Is, it, uh, is there any chance of it getting cleaned up? Is it considered a super fun site? Um, so some, some more questions on the on the landfill uh, that landfill downtown is one of several landfills um, it is not uh, a super fun site um, it's what we call an inert landfill meaning that in and of itself in its current condition it's not creating a hazard but if we were to intersect it with groundwater flow that could become a hazard because we could start mobilizing contaminants associated with that landfill that are not mobile right now Having said that, are there never say never. There is another landfill that was downtown that actually got relocated as part of the Caterpillar headquarters project. Um, it was a significant cost, but significant benefit, and it was tied to an economic activity. Um, I, I don't know that there's any concrete plans to relocate the, the other landfill at this time, but um, there, there's always that potential. In the meantime, what I would say is it's not a strength ability to achieve the project to achieve the project as it stands today and the, the magnitude of flow we have today. Um, and I, I mentioned South, but we also 
very likely could march further north. And I'd say there's a there's a degree of potential to connect from Heritage Reach all the way to the Agua Nueva Reach, which currently flows near Roger Road, um, because we have infrastructure there, potential. It could expand both south and north from where if that would would be relocated, it, there would be benefits, um, but it's not a, a, a significant constraint at this time. Cool, thank you for that, Tim. Hey, uh, one last question, and I'm gonna turn it over to, to Jonathan Horse. And um, Jonathan is uh, director, I, I may not get your exact title right, director yeah. of conservation, conservation research. Okay. Maybe say that one more time without me talking over you. Yeah. All right, uh, Director of Conservation and Research. And I just wanted to ask Tim, um, I know when the Heritage Waters Project was getting uh, initiated, there was plan for a second outfall uh, with a much higher flow rate um, somewhere between, or somewhere just south of Congress was the anticipated location. Um, is there any update uh, on when that might be coming into play? So that is correct. There was uh, what we call this two. Um, we have a large reclaimed water pipeline that crosses the river at Cushing Street Bridge, or well, it's buried, but it's it's a Cushing uh, alignment. Um, there's no set time frame on when we would deploy that. That is still a potential um, for additional reclaimed water um, to be discharged at that location. And that would certainly generate flow moving further north. Um, we, we've paused for a moment because first of all, the current outfall flows much further north than we thought. We thought we'd have flow from Mission Lane, or I'm sorry, from Silver Lake basically to Mission Lane. It actually goes all the way to St. Mary's. So putting additional water in it at uh, King um, may not have a benefit from a recharge standpoint because we're saturating the channel through that stretch. Um, but we also have an area near where additional water, it, it'd be a rethinking of other all would be. And um, we're actively pursuing um, looking at a uh, an outfall near Speedway um, to connect with where the water currently, it basically just reaches Speedway at our current flow, flow rate. So, um, uh, not, I'm not saying no con uh, no Cushing outfall. I'm saying not yet, um, but more outfall, like very long on the way. Okay, cool. Thanks. Not yet is always a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Tim. Hey, we really appreciate you uh, sharing your, your time and your expertise with us. Thanks for all that you and Tucson Water are doing and have done and will do. Thank you, Olia, for sharing uh, everything about the, the bird surveys. And uh, Olia, would you share your last slide one more time with us so that if anyone is interested in joining the volunteer team and doing these bird surveys, I know that uh, we are looking for a few more people, right? Yeah, absolutely, good idea. So if you're interested in joining the, the Tucson Audubon bird survey team for the Santa Cruz River area, Here's Olia's uh, email address. I'm gonna put this in our follow-up email that'll come out later this afternoon with a recorded session. And you can, uh, in fact, Olia will be CC'd on that email. So if you have any further questions, you can reach out to her, or if you wanna get involved, you can uh, respond directly to her as well. Um, you know, we, we love our volunteers and um, thank you to all of you who are on this call who have been doing that. I know there's a few of you here. So let's, uh, I'm gonna, if, if you wanna take yourself off of mute and thank Olia and Tim, a little bit of a verbal appreciation is always good. And then we'll uh, we'll end our session. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed thank it. You thank you for coming. Thank very, you. very informative. Thank you. Yeah. You yeah. excellent. All That's right. Good Have a good one, everyone. See you. See you next time. Thank you, Tim. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.